When last year, when everything began um, closing down, we had no idea how we were going to be able to function as a church. The first thing that we decided was that we were going to concentrate only on two aspects, evangelism and reaching out to the community. So we allocated all the funds that we could from the rest of the departments and concentrated there to continue to work with our community in a way that we could still preach the gospel, but reaching those are in need. And that's what we started doing. Um, we had already a food bank that was working, um, a combination with other people. And we started to reach out to those people that were having difficult situations, like no jobs, they couldn't pay the rent and so forth. Um, one day I got a call, um, Dr. Kim from the English Arden Church had a patient that he was diagnosed pretty much his kidneys were not working anymore. He was in dialysis. He had been Dr. Kim patient many years before. They kind of lost contact and then he came back again to the hospital being very sick. Um, Vicente Gonzalez, which is his name, his sister from Texas had called Dr. Kim trying to see if they could help him. Dr. Kim, since he doesn't know Spanish, contact the elder of the church, uh, which is Cesar, and um, Cesar contacted me. Vicente was really adamant that he didn't want nothing to do with God or he was an interest. The hospital, Advent Health, had told him that he barely had two weeks to live. Um, he was as hard as a rock. He didn't want to, he wanted nothing to do with Jesus. Immediately we scheduled a visitation. We, when we got there, his wife uh, refused to let Cesar and Dr. Kim come in because Vicente didn't want to know nothing about God. So after Cesar spoke with me, we decided that the way we're going to try to go in is offer assistance, food assistance, and help him with some of his rent and electricity. Because of that, every single week we make sure to go to his house to reach usually every Thursday, and try to bring a box of food and see what other ways we could help with pain bills or something else. So he allowed um, church members to start coming in. And as time passed by, a few weeks passed by, he only had two weeks to live. But he noticed that two weeks had already passed, and even though he was still feeling sick, but he was feeling hopeful. And one day he asked a question about Jesus. He loved um, about miracles because he wanted a miracle for himself. So he started asking us about stories about miracles. So every week we had to tell him about a miracle. But you know, sometimes you run out of stories, not sure what to do. And one of those days that we were visiting, we, um, the conversation began with the story of Nicodemus. And um, he usually never asked questions other than, I want to hear a story about miracle. But this time he was very interested in Nicodemus' questions and the response he got uh, from Jesus. And then he started asking about baptism. Now, this was very difficult at the moment for the family because most of his family belonged to another denomination. But the family was still glad that he was interested in knowing about Jesus. So they were a little more open and I want us to come and, um, and study and share. He finally decided one day that he wanted uh, to give his life to Jesus. It's been already around three months after his diagnosis that he was only going to live two weeks. And in his heart, he felt the need that he needed to give his life to Jesus. The family was concerned because he was very fragile. His body couldn't stand for long, but he was adamant that he wanted to do a baptism. We offer a profession of faith based on his situation, but he was adamant he wanted to have a regular baptism, just like the Bible says. The next question we had was how we could do a baptism. He's very fragile. So we came up with ideas on how we could do it at the baptistry. And then one day he said, no, I want to do it at a river. The water was very cold, rivers were 
you know, maybe July is not so cold, but in the mountains, the water are cold. So his family, his, his wife was very concerned. Part of his family was concerned, but he kept insisting that he wanted on the river. He went out one day and pointed at a river and said, I wanted to do it here. The problem was this river had a lot of current. Um, it was very strong. And in his state of being, it was a little difficult. But he kept insisting. We kept studying with him. And he finally said, it needs to be this Sabbath. I still remember because um, that July, um, we were doing some evangelism event online. When I got the call from the elder, it needs to be this Sabbath. My schedule was super tight that Sabbath. But I said, well, I'm going to have to cancel everything. And we've got to make it happen. We went to the river, and that day, that river, I've done baptism there before, but that day, that river was super cold, and the current was super strong, to the point where um, the people that take care of the park recommended not to go in. But he insisted, I need to be baptized. So we created a plan where two elders will come, on, come inside with, with me to help me kind of hold him, he could barely, he couldn't stand not even for five seconds. It took us at least 30 minutes to take him from the shore inside the river. And finally, on that day, he gave his life to God. Some of the family from Texas came to witness that moment. Even though they belonged to another denomination, they were so glad because for years, they've tried to talk to Vicente about giving their life to God. But Vicente was very adamant that he doesn't want nothing to do with God. But on that day, you could feel um, as I was holding him and I could see in his eye that he was just surrendering. On that day, July 18, Vicente Gonzalez gave his life to God. And unfortunately, but at the same time, by the grace of God, three days later, he passed away. Everybody's grateful and the family's very grateful because in a three month period, they could see how Vicente changed his life from somebody that was very rude, somebody that, um, you know, he did the best he could as a dad, but even the kids confessed that everything changed with that first visit that we did and the way we approach. Um, today, we're still working with his wife uh, we still visit them, we reach out to them. And the good thing is that the family is very grateful because not only was he able to give his life, but God extended his life. Remember that the doctor said he only had two weeks to live, but yet he stayed three months and that was enough time to give his life to God. We are very grateful for the opportunity that God you know, the way God uses his people to reach out to others. And that's something that I will never forget because it was a story that really impacted my life um, of many years I've done the ministry. You know, we are very grateful that through the efforts of the Carolina Conference and the Department of Evangelism, we are able to help out in the community. You know, the only way it was possible is if we had the means to do evangelism in a different way. And um, we want to thank each one of you that are supporting the evangelism um, department and the Carolina Conference, not just through your prayers, but also to the financial means as you put in every single month or every single week and support um, this effort of reaching those that are in need. And we're just grateful for the support, the financial support that you keep giving to the Carolina Conference. Thank you and God bless.